Hi, we're going to continue on with our discussion of the integumentary system lab. In, in this video, we'll talk about all of the accessory structures of the skin. Here you see the model again that matches the model we use in lab. And this is a model that shows us the layers of the skin, which we talked about in the previous video, as well as the accessory structures that are present in the skin. In this video, we're going to focus on the accessory structures. We'll start with the hair. You'll notice first off that the hair is present where the thin skin is, not the thick skin. Thick skin, which you see represented in this area right here, um, over, is present on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. And that skin is hairless. The other skin, however, thin skin, which is present over the rest of our body, does have hair present. Hair is separated into multiple regions. The part of the hair that you see here that extends past the surface of the skin is referred to as the shaft. So number 11 is identifying the hair shaft or the shaft of the hair. This is a dead region of the hair that you can see and feel and touch the part of the hair that extends beneath the surface is referred to as the root. So number 12 is pointing to the root of the hair. Just like the roots of a tree, right? The roots of the tree go underneath the surface of the ground and they anchor the tree and they pull nutrients up for the tree. This is the same thing with the root of the hair. It anchors the hair deeper within the dermis. At the bottom of the hair, you see that there's this expanded portion right here. And this expanded portion is referred to as the bulb. It looks kind of like a teardrop or like a flower bulb, like a tulip bulb. The bulb is where there is actual living tissue present. So bulb is number 13. This is where the cells divide to push the hair up to provide for hair growth. <clears throat> in the very center bottom of the bulb, there's this little notch that's present. That little notch is showing you a swelling of connective tissue that's referred to as the dermal papilla. This is the area where you can see the blood vessels entering into the bulb. Um, that's what these little red and blue things are. The red little lines are showing you arteries bringing blood into the hair, and the blue little line is showing you the veins bringing blood out of the hair. But this is how all of the nutrients get down to the living cells in the bulb <clears throat> where the hair matrix is um, so that the hair can continue to be fed with nutrients so that it can continue to grow. You'll also see number nine here is pointing to this muscle that's associated with the hair. That muscle that's associated with the hair is referred to as the erector pili muscle. The erector pili muscle. Um, when this muscle contracts, it pulls on the root of the hair and the hair stands up on end. So your hair stands up and you get goosebumps. So think about when you think this muscle might contract. You don't consciously control this muscle, right? You can't consciously make yourself um, have goosebumps or make your hair stand up. But this erector pili muscle will contract when you're scared um, and when you're cold. So when you're cold, obviously you've seen that you get goosebumps um, and then when you're scared, that's where the saying comes from when um, people talk about being really like weirded out and they say, oh, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. That's because when you get really scared, your hair does stand up. Now, this doesn't really have any benefit for humans, but if you think about an animal that has hair all over their body, this is beneficial. Um, when animals are, are scared and their hair stands up, they look larger and very frequently in the animal kingdom looking larger um, is enough to be able to avoid a fight or be able to scare off um, your opponent. So it is beneficial in other animals. It's just kind of left over in us. When we look at the skin, there are also multiple different types of glands that are present. 
and these glands produce secretions that end up being released onto the surface of the skin or onto the hair. The two major types of glands that we can see here are sebaceous glands and sweat glands. Sebaceous glands are oil producing glands. Sebaceous is spelled like this. Sebaceous glands are shown here by the number 10. They're these blue structures that you see associated with the hair. Uh, again, I said they produce sebum, which is an oily secretion that's rich in lipids, and it provides great lubrication. Frequently, sebaceous glands are associated with hair follicles, um, which the follicle is this kind of like purple this kind of purple tissue that you see surrounding and encasing the root of the hair. Um, <clears throat> these sebaceous glands are frequently associated with these hair follicles and they produce their, their sebum, their oily secretion, and it extends up and coats um, typically the, the base of the shaft of the hair. This is why if you don't wash your hair for a few days, it starts to get oily as that sebum starts to build up. There can be sebaceous glands that release sebum directly onto the skin's surface as well, um, but typically we'll see them here associated with the hair. The other type of gland that I said is the sweat gland. Now there are two major categories of sweat glands. There are eccrine glands and apocrine glands. Number six here is pointing to this kind of white coiled structure that you see. Um, and these other white coiled structures are also showing you examples of eccrine glands. They're also called merocrine glands. These eccrine glands or merocrine glands are relatively smaller glands. You can see they have ducts that come up and they lead up to the surface of the skin where we have a sweat pore that opens up. These eccrine glands are the glands that make normal sweat, the traditional salty, watery sweat that we produce in order to cool the body off. The other type of sweat gland that we have is this larger, typically deeper sweat gland that's called an apocrine gland. The apocrine gland is frequently associated with a hair. It's not shown that way on this model, but it is typically associated with the hair. And these apocrine glands are present only in very specific areas. They're present in areas where we get hair at puberty. So in the axillary region or the underarm, as well as in the groin region. These apocrine glands don't produce sweat to cool us off. Um, instead, they, pr they produce more of a kind of cloudy, sticky, um, smelly sweat that is related to pheromone communication. Um, <clears throat> again, this is kind of an evolutionary thing that uh, I don't think we utilize. Uh, we don't typically attract the opposite sex with our pheromones that we know of. However, other animals do. And um, this is still left over in us that we still make this, this really um, scented sweat that is rich in pheromones. That explains why these are located in the areas where we get hair at puberty and why they don't become active until puberty, because there's no reason to attract the opposite sex until you're ready to actually reproduce as far as you know, biology goes. So we have hair, um, as well as the erector pili muscle that's connected to the hair and the hair follicle that surrounds the hair. We have multiple types of glands, including sebaceous glands, apocrine glands, and eccrine glands. We also have multiple types of sensory receptors that are present in the skin. These provide um, senses like touch senses, right? Pressure, pain, texture, vibration, tickle, um, all of the things that you could possibly feel when someone touches the surface of your skin. The two types of sensory receptors that we'll look at are the pastinian corpuscle, or it's also called the lamellar corpuscle. That's the structure indicated by the number 16 that you see really deep down here. So that's the lamellar 
corpuscle, or again, it's also called Pacinian corpuscle. It looks kind of like an onion that's been cut. So this is the receptor itself, and then you can see this little nerve fiber that continues from it. What happens is when this receptor is actually physically compressed, when it gets pushed on, it sends a signal down this nerve fiber, the nerve fiber carries it up to your central nervous system, and then you, you notice the sensation of touch. Now this receptor is located pretty deep down in the dermis. So you can see that um, it would take a, a good amount of pressure to stimulate this receptor. You would have to push down on the surface of the skin deep enough to compress that much to get down and actually push on this receptor to notice it. So we utilize that for more deep pressure and vibration. The other type of receptor that we'll look at is up here and this is called a tactile corpuscle tactile corpuscles are these small little sensory receptors that are located up very superficially um, up towards the very top of the dermis you can see them here inside the little papilla and it's just deep to the epidermis so they're really close to the surface these are also touch receptors so the way that they work is they have to actually be touched they have to be actually physically compressed or squeezed and then they send a signal in along this nerve fiber when it gets to your central nervous system you notice it now, because these are so close to the surface, you don't have to push very hard in order to compress them and send a signal. So these provide us with information about light touch. So tactile corpuscles are for light touch, lamellar corpuscles are for deeper pressure. Um, that is pretty much everything that you guys will need to know in here. Do pay attention to the blood vessels. Um, there are large blood vessels that come in and out through the hypodermis. And as those vessels branch, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. You can see that the vessels do travel up through the dermis and then they stop at the top of the dermis and then the veins bring the blood back out again. So the blood vessels go up to the very, very top of the dermis and there are tiny little vessels called capillaries up here at the top of the dermis but that's where the vessels stop. He notice you don't see any blood vessels present up here in the epidermis. The epidermis is avascular. There are no blood vessels present, which makes sense because it's so close to the skin, right? If we had blood vessels on the outside of our skin, we would be bleeding constantly. Any little scrape or bump would make us bleed. Um, the vessels are delicate, but because the vessels are deep underneath this, um, this layer of, of epithelial tissue with a bunch of keratin, they're protected. Okay, so the blood vessels stop at the very top of the dermis. That's where you see these tiny little capillaries present. All right, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and send me an email or post a comment and I'll be happy to answer them.